So that is the reading. All right. <laughs> so let me tell him because he's gonna have to make sure Mr. I mean Alexander has it on the right reading because when you finish yours, this they're gonna do the response oral. She's gonna sing the response oral, and then I guess just make sure you turn it to Alexander's read. Let me go get him. He has his paper, okay. If you didn't want, I just wanted to show you. I didn't know you had your paper. So you got your paper, but it's the same reading. Okay. Yeah. This is yours, huh? No, just, uh, no, no, no. That's the second just, reading? Th yeah, this, you just have to do your reading and then just say the, the, word, the of word of the Lord. And then you should be finished. It's yeah. Sad. Yeah, that's right. That's the same one. Okay. So you want to keep yours up here? You're going to bring, bring it with you. You can be reading over it if you want to. Is this where it was turned to? Yeah, the intention. No, yeah. this is where it was whenever. Right. Mm -hmm. When we came up. I think David was reading over here.
Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I know you're very excited about coming here, and we are here now. And maybe a lot more still coming, but we had to start because the bishop is here and all the guests is here. I'm so excited to uh, just stand up here and welcome you. First, I want to make sure we clear this part. There will be second collection for propagation of faith today. There's no church maintenance second collection today. And so if you'd like to donate to the church maintenance, just put in a first collection. And thank you very much. Dear Bishop Duca, a year ago, you came here to install me as a pastor of this church. And you said, if I had one person for confirmation, you would come. Today, we have three young, wonderful Catholics who are ready for sacrament of confirmation. And thank you for your love and your support. Before we begin our celebration today, I would like to call and invite those who came to St. Jerry Elementary School during 75 years. Please stand up so we can recognize you. Some of you might not remember those years. The trick is, if you take your high school graduation year and minus six, then you go back to elementary years, okay? So I want to call each decade, if you will, like 40s, and then 50s and 60s, and so if you fall into that decade, you just stand up so we can see how beautiful you are, okay? The first, the first group is those who are involved in building the church and, this, and the school 75 years ago. If you know what's going on here back then when they started it, please stand up so we can see if you're still around here and see you. Anybody? Francis, you're not there? <laughs> All right, beautiful. Thank you very much. Go along because we have to stop mass very soon. Those who study in this school, the elementary school now is not a the uh, high school. Elementary school during 1944 to 49, which is the the 1940s. Stand up. All right, we have a few here. Very good. All right. Those who study in 1950s to 59, 50 to 59, please stand up. Please be seated. How about 1960 to 69? Many years ago, many years ago. How about 70 to 79? All right, we have more now. How about 80 and 89? Now how about 90 and 99? They don't use social media, so they don't know. Are you 90, 99? All right. How about 2000 and 2009? Okay, we have still here. Thank you. Thank you for coming. How about 2010, 2020? All right. And this one is a big one. Those who are teachers in 75 years. So it doesn't matter what decade you fall in. Teachers, coaches, faculty, counselors, janitors of both schools, St. Jerry Elementary School and high school. Please stand up so we can recognize you. Because of you, we are here. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. And today we celebrate 75 or 75th anniversary of Redemptive St. Jerry Elementary School. And, and the feast, in the feast day of St. Jerry Magella, our patron saint of the church and the school, 75 years is a long history to remember and to share. 
As a pastor of St. Jerry, I am very honored to be able to welcome you and celebrate this day with all of you, especially our civil and spiritual leaders. So I'd like to recognize a couple of VIP today. So Mrs. Sharon Weston Broom, the uh, mayor president of Baton Rouge, Louisiana, please stand so we can see you. Thank you, Paul. And of course, we have our dear Bishop Michael Gerald Gerard Duca is a bishop of Baton Rouge Diocese and the principal prayer celebrant and homilist today. So thank you, Bishop. For... And also, Dr. Mel, uh, the uh, superintendent. Are you here, Dr. Mel? Would you stand up? She's not here yet. And we have Eddie Responi and family. Are you here? Yes, Mr. Daddy and Sammy. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much for coming. And of course, our present principal, Ms. Cheryl Domino. Please stand up so we can know that you are here. And all benefactors, alumni, and friends, and redemptors in Jared. This school and this church is our mission. And this mission is ultimately God's mission. You are our dear friends and missionaries of this community. On behalf of the school and church, I want to say thank you. And let me just end with a, a small one call. Because of you, we are here. Because of you, we have no fear. Because of you, we are strong. Grow, grow, grow. Grow, grow, grow. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you.
In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Hold on a second. Peace be with you. It's a joy to be with you today. First of all, as I've saying most times, it's just good to be around a lot of people again, especially here today to celebrate this great feast day of St. Jared, Jer Jared. Today, my name is officially Bishop Michael Jared Duca, okay? Although all my whole life, you know, I pronounced it another way. Uh, today, I'm, I'm, I'm Bishop Michael Jared, and I will hold to that name today. My, my saint, patron saint, um, that I, my middle name, my mother gave me at my birth. My brothers and sisters, it's always good to celebrate the good things, the, the fruit of our labor, and, and, uh, and the power of the Christian community working among us. Uh, anytime we come together to celebrate this many years, um, it is a chance for us to really give thanks to God for all of our blessings. 
But as we come together, we always take a moment to humble ourselves, recognizing for all the good things we have done, at times we do tear at the fabric of Christian love among ourselves. So let us take a moment, first of all, as we begin to take a moment to recognize our need of God's mercy and love and offer our prayers a petition, remembering that we have a merciful God. Give us our sins and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. God, who willed to draw St. Jared to yourself in his earliest years and to mold him to the image of the crucified Son, grant, we pray, that following the example of his life, we may be transformed in the same image of Christ. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring glad tidings to the lowly, to the heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners to announce a year of favor from the Lord and a day of vindication 
by our God to comfort all who mourn, to place on those who mourn in Zion a diadem instead of ashes, to give them oil of gladness in place of mourning, a glorious mantle instead of a listless spirit. You yourselves shall be named priests of the Lord. Ministers of our God shall be called. I will give them their recompense faithfully, a lasting covenant I will make with them. Their descendants shall be renowned among the nations and their offspring among the peoples. All who see them shall acknowledge them as a race the Lord has blessed. The word of the Lord. Second reading, a reading from the letter of Paul to the Philippians. More than that, I even consider everything as a loss because of the supreme good of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have accepted the loss of all things and I consider them so much rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him not having any righteousness of my own base 
on the law, but that which comes true, faith in Christ. The righteousness from God, depending on faith to know him and power of his resurrection, and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming conformed to his death. If somehow I may attain the resurrection from the de dead, it is not that I have already taken hold of it or have already attained perfect maturity, but I continue my pursuit and hope that I mo may possess it. Since I have intend been taking possession of by Christ Jesus, brothers, I for my part do not consider myself to have taken possession. Just one thing, forgetting what lies behind but straining forward to what lies ahead. I continue my pursuit toward the goal, the prize of God's upward calling in Christ Jesus, the word of the Lord. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Amen, amen, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains just a grain of wheat. But if it dies, it produces much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will preserve it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there also will my servant be. The Father will honor whoever serves me. I am troubled now, yet what should I say? Father, save me from this hour. But if it was for this purpose that I came to this hour, Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven, I have glorified it and will glorify it again. The crowd there heard it and said it was thunder, but others said, An angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered and said, This voice did not come for my sake, but for yours. Now is the time of judgment on this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw everyone to myself. The Gospel of the Lord. Bishop Dukkha, 
The Paris community of St. Jerry Magella wishes to present to you its candidates who have prepared and are ready to receive the fullness of Christian initiation in the Sacrament of Confirmation. Each candidate has been well instructed and is accompanied by a sponsor. It is my privilege to present them to you at this time. I invite the candidates to stand up for confirmation to please them. Caleb Brown, Faith Abulu, and Kathy Amador. So you are prepared, so I don't have to question them publicly. There are some people in this group that remember being questioned publicly by the bishop. Don't throw them under the bus, Father. Tell me they're prepared. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> they're prepared. Thank you very much, Bishop. God bless you. I'll question the sponsors. There you go. Boy, 75 years. And I also have some people stand up that were here at the beginning. I have a little bit of a running joke that began last year at a um, meeting of the St. Vincent de Paul Society, which had a lot of elder members or wise members of the community. Um, not unusual because St. Vincent de Paul, if you're retired, you can give a lot more time to that work. And so I think that's why a lot of them are a little bit older. But we were talking in, in the slideshow, they, they um, they had some rock music on one of the slideshows about one aspect of the, the history. I forgot which, which song they used, one I remember from my, from my youth, one I can hear on classic rock on the Sirius radio satellite station. See, some of you were listening out there. They, they, and, and I said, I wonder why we have that rock music here tonight, but we have people here of uh, a certain age. And then I said, oh, wait a minute. This is the generation that was at Woodstock. This, this, this is... And so, and, and I think about that right now, I think over those 75 years, for those of you who lived a full 75 or a major part of it, how much this country, this church has gone through, uh, how much has changed over those years. Within the own church, the, the Vatican Council, which is a major change for many people uh, who grew up uh, in that time of change. Went through the Vietnam War, we went through all kinds of upheavals uh, through that time, assassinations of presidents, um, all kinds of 9-11, things that have changed our lives markedly over all those years. And, you know, who would have thought 75 years ago that your pastor would be Vietnamese, you know, and speak Spanish on top of that, you know. Uh, who could have imagined? And you would like him too, I mean, I mean, on top of that. And so how can we even begin to imagine how God works, how God works through all those difficulties, all those changes, all those personal challenges that we have dealt with. But then again, we should not be surprised. But the church has lived over 2,000 years since Christ, and the message remains the same. The gospel is proclaimed, and the church, through the power of the Holy Spirit, is not undone. It's gotten close sometimes, it seems, but it is not undone. It is our great strength, especially as Catholics, that the church endures and the gospel is proclaimed. In today's first reading from the prophet Isaiah, we have this beautiful passage. The Spirit of the Lord of God is upon me. He has sent me to bring glad tidings to the lowly, to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives, the release to prisoners, to announce a year of favor to the Lord. You know, if you look at the way God worked throughout the Old Testament, we think of only that God had a chosen people. He chose the Jewish people to be the way in which he would introduce his message to the world. And that the, the, 
the good news was given, the good news, that God's love, the covenant with God, was given to the people of Israel as a special gift, something that they would take to themselves. But that's only a cursory reading of the scripture. If you look at the beginning of the scripture, the mission of God is to save the world. He sends a redeemer to redeem all mankind, even creation itself. And yes, he chose to enter the world, you might say, into the salvation history in another unique way after the fall of Adam and Eve through this covenant with Abraham to establish a clear identity of God's love for his people. I will be, you will, I will be your God and you will be my people. And within the context of Israel, he began to nurture his relationship with humanity but in the end, it was not a gift given just to Israel. For later on in the book of the prophet Isaiah, you will hear the word spoken, I did not create you just to build up the tribes of Israel. I will make you a light to the nations. In the end, Israel is that light on a hillside, giving light to all the world, ultimately bringing forth from its very midst the Savior of the world, Jesus Christ. And the message they're called to do, we hear in the prophet Isaiah, a gospel that's supposed to go out, ring out to all the world. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring glad tidings to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, liberty to captives, release to prisoners, a day of vindication by our God to comfort all who mourn, to place those who mourn in Zion a diadem instead of ashes, a lasting covenant I will make with them, with all the world. And in Jesus Christ that has come true. Jesus now, the light of the world. The light that we hold, the gospel that we proclaim, not to be held under a bushel basket, but to be lit up on the highest point to shine for all as a sign of hope, a sign of salvation. I say this because I think that is the key to any successful parish. In a moment, I, will, I, I thought it was really wonderful that you have three confirmations today. Because what I want to tell the confirmation candidates, and I tell all of you, because many of you I can see by age have, are already confirmed, is that what do we receive in confirmation? I believe we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for that final piece, because there are three sacraments that initiate us into the church. Baptism, Holy Communion, and Confirmation. With those three sacraments, we are fully initiated into the life of Christ, into the body of Christ, into the mission of the church. And I think it is in confirmation that gift of the Spirit is given to these young people today and given to us so that we can embrace the mission of the church, the mission. You know, that's what keeps the church alive. Oftentimes we reduce our faith down to simply a moralistic faith that our church is about telling us how to act. And so we go through these things we're supposed to do. Those of you who grew up learned about the seven, you know, the seven the laws of the church. Give them support of the church, bury them, all these things. You know, but it's not just about filling obligations. I know I've said it many times, but I keep saying it. Those of you who are raised Catholic, and you learn the things that made you Catholic, the kind of things that you know a Catholic does. Go to confession, go to mass, receive communion, you know, go to mass at Easter on, on Sunday, all those things, okay? Does anyone remember anyone telling you that one of the essential elements of your faith is to bring someone to Christ? Both of you no, I don't think anybody told me that. I mean, no one said it out loud. But yet, that is the fundamental mission of Jesus, to go out and proclaim the good news and baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Once the disciples received the Holy Spirit at that first Pentecost, they were so inspired, so understanding of the gospel, so filled with the joy of the gospel, that they immediately went out. They couldn't hold it in. They went out and began to proclaim the good news. And where the good news is proclaimed, where people come and can gather and feel themselves part of a mission, they flock to that place. 
If all you're going to a place, if you're going to Mass just out of obligation, not to, going to, just simply not to commit a sin, that is never going to be enough to fill us with life. It's only when we experience the joy of the Gospel in our hearts that we, we sense its, its, its motion, its movement, to go out and proclaim. The reason we try every day not to sin is not to get a gold star in heaven. Yes, we want to avoid going to hell, that's for sure. That's a good reason, for sure. But we really, what we are in is a spiritual journey to free ourselves from sin, which is self-centered, to let God, because every sin is small and self-serving. It fills us with, with bitterness and anger and frustration, or it enslaves us through pleasures and desires. It's always about us. God wants us to break the chain of death, the slavery of sin in our life, so we can be free to love, free to embrace the mission of the church. And in fact, one of the ways we break the power of sin over our lives is to be in mission, to put that as part of our lives. Because if we're all working together for a common purpose, if we're all working together to proclaim and live the gospel of Jesus Christ, we don't have time to notice how that person is dressed on Sunday. We don't have notice, that, you know, what that person might have said. We don't have time to consider whether that person is a, a good Catholic or a bad Catholic. We are together in Christ and we are working together and our mission keeps us focused together. And the church comes alive. It becomes even irresistible. That's the, that is the greatest evangelization we can do, is to be in a mission, a church filled with the love of those in need, whose, whose life not only sustains its strength as a community, because here we are nurtured at the altar, here we are nurtured through the Word of God, here we support and encourage one another. But we, we do all that, not to just simply, like, like God said in, through Isaiah, not just to build up the priestly caste or the tribes of Israel, all the little parishes building themselves into little tribes. No. We build, we build ourselves up so that we can go out. We can all ask ourselves, where in our lives is my faith directed from the strength of this parish and this altar where we receive the body and blood of Christ, where we become one with Christ in communion, where we become the body of Christ. In that moment, where is that, that, that joy within my heart? Where is it directed outside to someone in need? to someone who is doubting, to giving help to someone who is poor, to going to visit an aunt who, you know, you, you, when you know you're going to go there, it's going to take three hours to get out of there, but you know that person is alone and just needs someone to visit them, you know, and we go, not just out of obligation, because the joy of the gospel moves us to be Christ for others. Brothers and sisters, that's the strength of this parish, if it's going to be strong at all how we gather together. And that's why it's always good. We had, had a bishop, one time a bishop, the bishop I was, was my bishop growing up in Dallas, he came to a men's club meeting and I was there, my father invited me, it was a big deal for me. And he came and gave a, gave a sermon and I wish I had written those things. I was already a seminarian at the time. And I wish I had written down what he said because he, he, he gave about 10 little proverbs that really described the way this man acted, okay? For example, he would say, if someone comes and complains to me, uh, it tells me more about them than it does the person they're complaining about. So I remembered that one when he was my bishop as a priest. I never went and complained about anything, you know, because I knew he was sizing me up another way. But he also said, it's never good for a parish to be out of debt. I said, what the heck? I thought that the purpose was to get out of debt. And later on, I talked to him about that. He said, no, it's not good for a parish to have too much money. You got too much money. You're building things you don't need, and you're getting fat and you know lazy, and and you have no sense of mission unless you're taking that money and using it to build up the kingdom of God. We're like the man building silos, you know, keeping our grain, and now I get it all packed up and I can live for years on this. But then the Lord comes and takes his soul that night. You know, when you have a parish that's a little bit struggling, you know, people come alive. They come. They rise to the task. They find meaning in that purpose. And I think that's a great way in which this parish continues to go, and especially now in working together to continue to keep this school alive is a great gift to the community. And I think a part of the mission of the church 
to go out and build up the kingdom of God. One of the ways we've always known to do that in, in Catholicism is through education, to build up the kingdom of God. <clears throat> and brothers and sisters, I think you have a great place here to continue that good work. As long as you keep that sense of mission alive. We do that personally in, in putting ourselves out there and say, where can I take some of my time that I'd rather use for myself, but I'm going to take this and put it in service of others. My time, my talent, my treasure, how can I build up as a good steward, as a, as a disciple, build up the kingdom of God? Right now we're surrounded by all kinds of, it seems, darkness and confusion. And we wonder where our, our great leaders are going to come from in the future. And we, we're, it's, it's confusing at times. And we feel depressed because it's like the world is depressing us. But we should always remember that we don't get our hope and our joy from the world. We get it because of our faith in Jesus Christ. We are the ones, in fact, that are supposed to be the salt for the earth, the leaven. We are supposed to be bringing the joy and hope to the world, the joy and hope of Jesus Christ. We are the ones who can stand in the midst of the affirmity, of challenge, even at the grave of someone we love, and proclaim hope. Because not even death defeats us. No matter how bad things are now, they've been bad over the past 75 years. And we've grown and we've been changed. And out of it have come great gifts from conflicts across the ocean. We thought, you know, we're going to undo us as a country. And now we have a kind of unity. And the unity comes from a common faith. The Catholic faith in Vietnam transferred here to now become one church together. Brothers and sisters, that is our strength. That is our joy. Do never let, you know, one of the things that Mother Teresa's sisters here, and I said it at their, at their uh, anniversary this year, well, the feast day of Mother Teresa. Mother Teresa, I got a little quote, I, I think about it all the time, that nothing ever so fill you with sorrow that you forget the joy of the risen Christ. You know, that's our strength. And that's the joy I feel when I come to St. Jared's, and that's the joy I see when I visit with Father Pat and his, and his brothers, priests who serve here. And that is, our, that is our strength in the world today. And we've done it for 75 years around this school and parish. My prayer is we'll do it for another 75 years. But a lot of it depends on keeping the spirit of the parish alive. And if, you, you know, if you're not growing, you're dying. And you might say, well, everybody's moving away. No, not everybody's moving away. You're surrounded by people who live here. Part of the gospel is to go out and make and bring people to Christ. Is it hard for someone raised in the Protestant church to kind of understand the Catholic faith? Yeah, it's almost impossible for us, but with God, all things are possible. And so make sure you're a parish that's welcoming. Make sure you continue to be a parish that has a strong sense of mission. Make sure that everyone who comes through those doors has what, what some people have described as a low threshold, that is, it's easy to get, you know, they don't have a lot of steps to get up into this church. And when someone comes into this church, they, they, through someone, they are welcome. They are recognized as being new. And they have a place here to sit. And even though they don't understand what's going on, it's a moment where God can work in them. Because they feel welcomed. And believe me, once someone overcomes that obstacle, then God's grace can pour in. And what may seem impossible for us is not impossible for God's grace. And all of us know that at some point in our life, we thought we were down and out. We were not going to make it. Something, a grace, switched it. From someone coming to us, an insight, answer to a prayer, we were lifted up. We were reminded. And we were renewed in faith. I congratulate you all on this 75 years. And again, and glad to be on the journey for part of the next 75 as well. Let's continue to trust in the Lord, hope in the Lord, and at all times be his disciples and proclaim his good news to the world.
So I could ask the three candidates and their sponsors to come forward and stand here in the center. Right in the center. My dear friends, you have already been baptized and now receive the power of God's Spirit and be signed with this cross on your forehead. You receive the gift of God's Spirit to empower you with His graces that you need to embrace the mission of the church, to go out and witness His love to the world. Be active members of the church alive in Jesus Christ. Under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, seek to serve all people like Christ who came not to be served, but to serve. And now before you receive the Spirit of God, call to mind the faith which you professed in baptism and renew that faith now in preparation for your confirmation. And so I ask you, and as they renew their baptismal promises, I'd like to ask us all to respond, at first with a very quiet voice, so we can hear the voice of our, well, three, you know, hear the voice of our confirmation candidates. But on the last one, I'm gonna ask you to answer with a full voice so they can feel the faith of the strength that faith, or the strength of the faith that surrounds them today. And so I ask you and ask all of us, do you renounce Satan and all his works and all his empty promises? Do you believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth? Do you believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was born of the Virgin Mary, suffered death and was buried, rose again from the dead, and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty? I do. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who today, through the sacrament of confirmation, is given to you in a special way, just as the Spirit was given to the apostles on the day of Pentecost? I do. And with this last one, we want a strong I do if you really believe. And do you believe in the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting? I do. Oh, don't you love that? Sounds great. This is our faith. This is the faith of the church. We are proud to profess it in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Dearly beloved, let us now pray to God, the Almighty Father, for these his adopted sons and daughters, already born again to eternal life in baptism, that he will graciously pour out the Holy Spirit upon them to confirm them with his abundant gifts and through his anointing, conform them more fully to Christ, the Son of God. Sponsors, if you'll place your hand on their shoulder. And fathers, if you'll extend your hands. Let us pray. Almighty God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who brought these your servants to new birth by water and the Holy Spirit, freeing them, O Lord, freeing them from sin. Send upon them, O Lord, the Holy Spirit, the paraclete. Give them the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and fortitude, the spirit of knowledge and piety. Fill them with the spirit of the fear of the Lord. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Oh my God. 